coaches. Today, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, CoachPad. Uh, no matter if you draw scout cards by hand or use a program on your computer, CoachPad will give you back time by never stuffing a binder again before heading out to practice. First 13.3-inch electronic device allowing coaches to clearly display scout cards outdoors in the sun has been a game changer for programs this past fall and those currently playing all across the country. This new technology allows coaches to coach and not the monotonous task of stuffing and dealing with binders on the practice field. Check out the Coach Pad and Coach Pad Mini on thecoachpad.com. Please make sure you check out our sponsors, our affiliates. And here is another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast. Um, today we have the new head coach at uh, the original Old Tangy High School, uh, Coach Wade Bartholomew. Uh, coach, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, kind of before we get into a variety of things, um, can you kind of give people your background, maybe if they don't, especially my out-of-state um, audience that do not know you? Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm currently 35 years old. Um, I played uh, football in high school at Westfall High School, graduated, wanted to attempt playing college football. So I went to Ohio Dominican University in their early stages of the football program, um, ended up transferring out and finished my career at Capital University. Um, from there, my father, who's, you know, we'll talk a little bit about as we get it through this, has um, been a head coach for quite a bit of years in the state of Ohio was going to Logan Elm high school. So he asked me to come over and be his quarterback coach and OC. Uh, so I went over there for three years, um, got the opportunity to start my head coaching career at 23 years old at Huntington Ross, um, down in Chillicothe. And, uh, my first year wasn't the greatest. It was a program that lost 26 straight games, uh, when I got there. So in you know, my first year, we went 0 and 10, uh, second year, we kind of turned around, got an opportunity to go to Gallia Academy. Um, which is on the river in Gal Plis. I uh, thought I was going to finish my career there. I absolutely loved it. Um, people were great. Um, but I got a phone call um, right after that very first year from um, an AD up here at Bloom Carroll. Um, it's a closer move for my family and me. So we came up to Carroll uh, for eight years. Um, I, was, I was at Bloom Carroll recently, um, coaching football, teaching math. Um, I got a wife and two little children. Um, and now we're heading to Olentangy, some uh, a couple a bigger school to see if we can survive in this uh, ferocious OCC everybody tells me about. It, it, it is the OCC is a different ball game, coach. I, I spent a year coaching in, I and I worked two years at Westland, so I kind of I kind of get that there. Before we kind of get into some of the head coaching stuff, I want to talk about today. Um, you recently coached our state all star game. Um, I, I worked it, and you were coaching it. Uh, what was that kind of experience like? I mean, obviously, the North-South game is very interesting, especially um, when you get a lot of alpha personalities together. Um, I saw both staffs. There's the very interesting group dynamic. So how was that kind of experience for you? Yeah, um, well, first off, it was kind of a dream come true. I, I My dad, when I was in high school, got an opportunity to coach in the Big 33 game when it was still around. And so I got to kind of tag along as a you know, 15, 16 year old kid. And, um, Teddy Ginn Jr. was on the team and, and Brian Hoyer was on the team and a couple of these big name guys that I got to know. And they were just high school kids at the time. So ever since I became a head coach, my goal was to coach in an all star game. I wanted to be around some of those kids. I wanted to get to know, you know, some some kids from all over the place. Um, but our, our team was awesome. Uh, I don't know if it was the Southern Ohio feel. I don't know if it was the, the way our coaching staff. <coughs> Our game but but we had no alphas we had no egos like our kids showed up they played how they wanted to play um, they did whatever we asked them to do and I had a ton of fun with it I'll tell you what it's super interesting trying to put a an offense together when you only got four practices to get it implemented um, but that was unique you know that was definitely a nice little fun experience of trying to figure out how do you simplify everything how do you you know, bring it into where you want to signal it, but you got four days to teach it to the kids and you got, you know, 33 kids you got to teach it to. Um, quarterbacks that, you know, you're wanting to communicate with the offensive line and how you can do that in a short period of time. So I'd say what as, a, as an offensive coordinator was a really good, neat experience because it, it really taught you how to simplify things and it taught you how to, to not bring everything to the plate and try to, 
you know, you're basically game planning, you know, like a Monday through Thursday, but yeah, it's, it's a brand new team. So just imagine going into week two <laughs> with a brand new team trying to win a game. And that's basically what we did, but it was a lot of fun. Um, getting to meet all those other kids. I mean, everybody from smaller schools like me that, you know, have never been anywhere bigger than technically the division four school. When you, when you see those one through three kids, you're thinking, Oh my gosh, like these kids are, you know, they're, they're on their own real. They're these like godsends kind of a people, but they were just normal high school kids. They were 18 year old kids that wanted to be up there, wanted to have fun. And man, they were so polite. Like it was, it was probably one of the best groups that, that the all-star team had had from what I heard from a lot of those guys that our kids were just great. So it was, it was a dream come true experience. I would love to do it again. I, like I said, it was a ton of fun, um, but we also had an unbelievable group. I mean, our, our 30, whatever, 37 man roster, like not one kid ever complained about playing time. Not one kid ever whined about getting the ball. Um, and then it was just, uh, it was a lot of fun. I would say that. Good. Good. I mean, that's kind of what you always want to hear. And um, I've coached our local all-star game and I kind of the same thing. I mean, the practices are the hectic part, but the kids are usually fantastic. They end up yeah. playing yeah. And usually with the coaches too. And um, so kind of, kind of going into it, I mean, you mentioned your first year at Huntington Ross was not fantastic. I mean, I, it's hard when you take over a program that struggled. I mean, there's, that's not, there's no sure could have, but what do you kind of learn from that, that first year? I mean, because we're, I mean, because you went from the zero and ten years to five and five the next year. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've been there. I mean, when I was at Elgin, we went zero and ten the first year, and the following year we went seven and three. Now there's a lot yeah. of factors that go into that. But what did you kind of take from that first year? You're like, okay, this didn't work. This worked. Um, I know you've mentioned in some um, interviews in the past that uh, a lot of it was building relationships and the nutrition aspect. But kind of what else was there that you kind of figured out? Because, again, there is no manual for taking over a program. You can say you're ready, but you never are until you go through the fire. Yeah, um, man, I, did you have three hours? <laughs> I mean, uh, no, um, you know, we, I know I talk a lot about the relationship aspect, but that, that was, was a big key um, there at Huntington. Like some of those kids that didn't play football, we got an opportunity to get out to come play football because – after that first year, a lot of our football kids were walking the hallways and talking very highly of, of my coaching staff and I and the way we treated them and how much fun we were having with them. And that football wasn't this grind sport, you know, a lot. We were we were coming in and, and getting done with practice and letting them have some fun with each other. So I, I, th and I think that helped, you know, so kind of, quote unquote, recruiting the hallways through your kids um, <clears throat> helped. So we got two or three really key pieces to come out that next year that we all know it's not the X's and O's. It's those, it's those kids, it's those dudes. Um, so that really helped. Uh, I would say the other ways of just learning how to practice, you know, I mean, and then, you know, when we got to Huntington there, there's first couple of times um, there was only 25 kids on the team the year before. So when we, when we increased it from 25 to 50, that first year, there was half the kids that didn't even know how to practice football. So getting a whole year of just learning how to practice under their belt and getting them the confidence to be able to do what you do um, was great. The other thing I, I would say, and I, I highly suggest this to young coaches, and um, I learned this from my dad. So luckily I, I didn't make this, this mistake, but I think this is a mistake I see a lot of young coaches make is they come in wanting to win so bad that they week to week try to change schematically. And they week to week try to find this little wrinkle that's going to help them try to beat this team because they just want to get a win. You have to stay your course. You have to understand that maybe that first year is a sacrifice. And it sucks. It sucks for that senior group. It sucks for those kids. Um, you know, you obviously don't tell them <laughs> that they're the sacrificial lambs. But realistically, you have to stay, stay the course with what your base stuff is. And I think that's what we did really, really well at Huntington. We went 10 straight games probably only scoring six, seven points a game on average, but we ran our stuff. We ran exactly who we are. We did what we did. Um, we didn't try to throw a few wrinkles in. We didn't try to change defensively. We just fund, works on the fundamentals. We worked on all those little things that we knew really good teams had time to focus on because they'd already had everything established. And so when we came in that second year, our fundamental skills were good and the scheme was known and our kids were ready to go and we just rolled with it and same thing with that next year like I, there, well, obviously every team I think at times has games that they know that they probably have a pretty good shot at losing when you're at that level and they have a chance to win you know Huntington we had 
you know, four teams on our schedule that we knew, hey, oh, we're probably not as talented as, you know. So, but even going into those games, like we didn't add wrinkles. We didn't add different things. I didn't look at the scheme of Westfall, who was a 901 program then, and say, oh man, like they do this wrong. Let's throw this play in to try to hit a big play. Just because like we spend all week trying to rep that and forget about the things that we should be doing fundamentally. So I think that's a big mistake a lot of coaches make. And I was lucky enough to not do it because my father told me that when I first got the job, that's one of the first things he said. He's like, do not try to schematically win games week to week. Just do what you do and get fundamentally better. And I felt like that was a huge part in our success. And, and it was it was the same thing here at Huntington or sorry, here at Bloom. Um, same idea. When we came in that very first year, um, we just we stayed the course and we never tried to just win games. We tried to build a program. OK, now they talk about that, because, I mean, obviously, I mean, you you spent two years at Huntington. You went from 0 and 10 to 5 and 5. Great turnaround in a, in a two year period. But I mean, you took over Bloom your first year, you're four, four and six. And then correct me if I'm wrong. You were what a state semifinalist this year. Yes, I mean, sir. Now, obviously, that's over a longer stretch. I believe you yeah. were at Bloom for, what, seven, eight, seven or eight years. I mean, so you kind of see what the program works. But talk about how you continue to evolve. Because, um, obviously, as head coaches, we're going to think, at, especially in the offseason, okay, this didn't work, this worked. What can I adjust? My, my, my are things with practice, my are things in the weight room. How have you evolved philosophically, especially over the last seven or eight years? Uh, tremendously um, unreal you you wouldn't I mean the, the kids at Huntington would uh, wouldn't recognize me as the coach now um, the kids at Bloom the very first year come back and laugh at me I have uh, I had three of them on staff the past two years and they just they just shake their head going oh my gosh coach like what what happened in, in seven years um, so it's been a huge huge transition um, coming in um, I always felt like you needed that competitive edge. You always talk about those guys that are, um, you know, put your put your your hand on their throat or you know kick them while they're down and just be a, an ultra ultra competitor and, and those kind of. Things. So when I when I came out of high school, you know, I I've been super successful in all my sports. I, I got a chance to go to you know ODU and we turned it around and the Capitals were a really good program. So I hadn't really lost a whole lot. And so I felt like winning and that competitive edge is what you need to teach kids. You need to teach them how to win and how to fight and how to grit. Um, and about, oh man, it had been year four at Bloom. We had a really talented group that had won all the way up through. And we really thought like, this is our group. This is that group's going to get us over the hump. We're going to win the league, blah, blah, blah. So we started grinding. We started fighting. And, and I wanted our kids to be super dedicated. I wanted to be accountable. And I had one of the worst off seasons personally I could have and as a program I could have because I, I felt like I was just fighting with our kids all the time I was fighting with this kid because he was he needed to go here or I was fighting with that kid who was in the weight room there and I was ticked off that one kid missed a day and he hadn't missed you know the whole spring and um, we got into the summer and same idea I felt like I was just pressuring 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 and um after that season, uh, we end up going, I mean, we, we had a decent year. We ended up going seven and three. We didn't achieve our goals of, uh, you know, winning the league. We did have a home playoff game for the first time ever at Bloom. So that was exciting. We got beat at home, which was kind of embarrassing. You know, we finally got there and then we brought somebody in and just got beat. So it was kind of like, oh, here we are, just one of those programs that we're just going to be a, you know, first round playoff team. And I kind of evaluated after the year and I just realized like, man, like that, that whole trying to win thing was just miserable. You know, each day, no matter what and you win and, you know, you go home and you find things that are wrong. You come back and watch the film and then you're kind of just constantly negative on the kids going, we got to get better here. We got to get better here. The coaches are trying to find the next new niche of, you know, what they can do better with their kids. And I just said, you know what, this winning thing is, is too much for me. So just, I, I took a personal leave out. I dove deep into um, Tim and Brian Kite's focus three stuff. Um, I, I traveled, you know, to several different seminars of leadership and, and tried to listen to some, you know, some people outside the game. I listened to a swim coach from um, up north in um, the state of Ohio that won like 14 straight national championships. Um, you know, I traveled to, you know, soccer coaches who'd been successful and, and listened to countless numbers of videos and podcasts and finally just said, you know what? All of these people keep talking about their success, but not one of them is talking about the, the want and the will to win. 
So we completely just switched our thought process. We put together what's called a culture playbook, which came from Tim and Brian Kite. And a lot of people know it more from the above the line stuff with the Urban Meyer. Um, and we, we decided we're going to focus on three words, um, selflessness, accountability, and relentless effort. That's it. Um, winning has nothing to do with those. And that's how we're going to evaluate our kids from that moment. Um, so we put winning down the list about level four. Um, and ever since we did that, I became happier. Our kids became happier. They, they actually became more dedicated. They became more competitive um, because every kid in our program could achieve those by simply just being who they are. And they didn't have to be this unbelievable football player. They didn't have to be this excellent you know, kid. They just had to they just had to show up and give us great effort and put the team first and, um, you know, just hold themselves to, to a certain standard that we had. And when I when I slowly started to slide winning down the list, um, it came just naturally to our kids because when we finally got in a dogfight of a game, they didn't have to worry about being perfect. They didn't have to worry about winning that game. They knew that if they just went out there and they did those three things, that at the end of the day, I was going to be happy. And I was going to come in the huddle at the end of the game just like I would if we'd won and, and was, but was proud of it. And, and our senior class that year in um, 2018, like just – brought in a hundred percent like they they were so miserable the year before we had several of them not wanting to play and I sat them down and just told them okay I promise I'm gonna be different give me another chance um and they did and they were great and then the group behind them did the same thing and they were awesome and before you know it you run into four really good groups of kids and then obviously some talent I and mean, we had some you know some really good kids I mean those first couple of years we were at Bloom we had some talented kids and if I would have had them for four years in our program we could have won games but it just we weren't ready um, and then when you run into a really good group of kids and a group of kids that's loving it and having fun, and we had kids that coming in as, you know, we all deal with these summer baseball kids, right? Summer, well, I have to deal with summer lacrosse kids now. Um, mm. but just basketball. They all want to go do other things. Well, at Bloom, yeah. they wanted to be at football. Like they were playing baseball in, in the evening or maybe they had a noon game. They would still come to 8 o'clock weightlifting because they were enjoying it and they had fun and because they wanted to be accountable and they wanted to be selfless teammates and they wanted to put the team first, like they would come. But then I also switched my mindset there too. You take a kid like that who you know has got a baseball game. He might not come in and do the whole workout. He might come in and do just the upper part of the workout and then let him kind of just hang around or let him skip out early or um, just understand that, you know, you're going to win with those kids more if they want to win rather than them getting, you know, five pounds stronger over the summer. Um, and so I've kind of taken that same philosophy from Bloom um, to Olin Tangy, where it's not about winning. It's about making your kids want to win. And you don't do it old school way anymore, in my opinion. It's not getting the tug of war rope out and, and trying to get them to fight and grind. It's not making them the weight room just absolutely miserable existence because you want them to, to know what it feels like on a Friday night, fourth quarter fourth and one like to me that's not what it's about anymore what it's about now is when that fourth and one comes does every single kid care enough about the kid next to him to truly give every ounce of effort he has and to use the fundamental skills that you've taught him because he cares enough about what you've told him and to me you build that through less is more you build that through those relationships i i, I strongly encourage every coach to try to build and i think you build that through sacrificing the game of football for all these stupid fun things that these kids are going to enjoy doing. I mean, we have over the port. If I, I, I could tell you in the last four years of bloom, we've had the most success that I've ever had and blooms ever had. We've probably missed probably 16 practices literally in the middle of the season doing something stupid like dodgeball, watching a movie, um, going out and playing freeze tag or, or water balloon fights where we just said, Hey, we're not practicing today. Let's go do something dumb. Let's go, let's go have some fun. And, um, a lot of people will shake their head and say, there's no way you did that. I mean, we're talking a Tuesday, Wednesday of game planning. I just came in and said, you know what, we're going to go play basketball. And we took all 80 kids last year, split them up into to eight teams of 10 and we played basketball. <laughs> like, I mean, and, and not a whole lot of coaches are going to be willing to do that. Obviously the injury thing like that. And then they're freaking out about game plans, but, um, that right there, I think, went so much farther with the, the transition and the, the growth of our program is our kids no longer felt like they were just football players. They knew that they were going to come in and, and be treated like kids, but have a lot of fun with it. Okay, no, I, I get that. Now, I mean, 
kind of, kind of continuing with that, like, I mean, you are in the process of moving while starting summer <laughs> lifting. I mean, for anybody watching the video version kind of knows that. I mean, but I mean, how's that process? I mean, really, how is that process of moving about, oh, I don't know, what is Bloom from Columbus? About 30, 45, 30 minutes? 45, yeah, 45 minutes. Yeah, 45 minutes. I mean, how's that process going? Obviously, you've been dealing with that all off season, the transition, but how is that? And, yeah. and what is that like? Yeah, um, it, it's it's nothing. I haven't obviously being to four schools now and, and really my short head coaching career. I mean, you know, most people like my dad's only been to three schools and he's been coached and a head coach for almost 30 years now. You know, I'm on my fourth school and, you know, what is that now? 11 years um, is um, I'm used to it. Uh, when I when I came from Galley to Bloom, it was a two and a half hour drive. Um, so I would I would leave on. Tuesday night, as soon as school was out, come up, run weightlifting from like six to nine or six to eight, just to get to know the kids and turn on and be back home at, at midnight, you know? <laughs> so like the 45 minute drive to Olentangy feels like it's an expressway uh, when it's, when you're coming, when you're coming up and getting back home, but it's been awesome. It's been unique. Um, so the one thing I've never had to deal with that was, was something new was I, there's a strength and conditioning coach. And so he's kind of running the program. He's great. He's awesome. But every place I've been, that was kind of where I could set the tone. I could come in, get let, let the kids get to know me as a coach. And how, here's how we go things. So when I when I took over, I felt disconnected. You know, I felt like I I didn't have much to say. I felt like I was just kind of a, a watcher, almost like a college recruiting coach coming in and just staring at the kids. And, you know, I, I tried to get to know them. I tried to learn their names. I tried to go around and ask. But, you know, they're trying to get a workout in. And, and you know, that there's really just not that time. You don't have time just to you know, kind of shoot the, shoot the crap with them and, and those kind of things. So what I did was I added kind of like a small, just real quick speed and agility optional thing at the end um, that I ran. And I, and the strength and conditioning coach was perfectly fine with it and he was great with it, but it gave me a little bit of power and it gave me a little bit of chance for the kids to see how I coached and who I was and those kind of things. Um, and then I started having meetings. I, I had a uh, meetings with my seniors. I had meetings with, um, you know, some of the returning starters. I had meetings with the incoming freshmen. Um, <clears throat> we took some kids out to eat, you know, some things like that, like just trying to do some things outside of that weight room that I could do. And then um, I showed up to basketball games. I showed up to volleyball games. I showed up to lacrosse games and baseball games and um, all these different stuff, just so the kids could see me in a different light and um, know and understand that I'm, I'm not here just to be the X's and O's football coach. And uh, I think that's what, what really helped me the most was uh, it was a lot of time. It is a lot of time. I mean, I, I know I, I jokingly told you before we <clears throat> kind of started, this was uh, we had midnight madness on Friday night, which is like a, a fun team competition thing that we do um, to kick off the summer every year. Uh, we, we draft our kids in the teams and we do, <clears throat> sorry. Um, we do like sled, you know, sled push races. We do trap bar carry races. We play tug of war. We do what would everybody, most people call speedball. Um, we do like a field goal kicking contest. We do like a pump passing kick thing. Um, just a bunch of stupid fun things that really don't have anything to do with football, but have everything to do with football at the same time, because they have to learn how to win with, you know, a new team. They have, they have to learn how to compete when they're tired because from nine to midnight, most of them have been up most of the day and, and you get to that 1130 grind and they're still going to have to fight and they're still going to have to run. So they, they get irritated and they get, and then they have to learn how to, to be coached because I put a coach in charge of each team and I run around, I'm the referee. And, you know, sometimes I do things on purpose. You know, I, I call certain things a certain way to see how a, a, my quarterback reacts when he thinks it's a touchdown. I tell him it's not, you know, or, you know, a DB thinks that, you know, he, he got away with pass interference and he didn't and he's cranky and he's arguing with me, but I got done with I got done with that at, you know, midnight that night and then uh, kind of cleaning up and everything. I didn't get home until about 2.30, uh, turned around, ro ro rolled around, woke up at 6 uh, yesterday morning, packed all day, went to four different graduation parties here at Bloom. Um, at 11.30 last night, I was loading up the box truck and uh, we'll be we'll be heading up there at 9 o'clock here this morning to unload it and finish up the rest of the day. So it's been a, it's been a heck of a transition. Um but it's uh, but it's definitely something that me and my family are super excited about. Good. Now, the other thing is you again, you've been at four different schools now. Um, what is how do you approach hiring a staff? Oh, um, that's probably the weakest link of mine, to be totally honest with you. And I don't mean I have bad staffs. 
what I mean is I, I'm a, I'm a guy that sees the good in everybody. Um, so everybody I bring in, I see a highlight. I see exactly what they could bring to the table. And I'm super excited when they walk out like, Oh man, this could be my guy. Um, but I, but I go through, um, what I really want to see in, in the, at the end of, at the end of the interview, what I really want to see is I want to see what exactly do I truly believe this guy's in coaching for. And, and if I can get a feel that they're here for the kids and there, there's no ego um, and maybe it's a, maybe it's a passion for the school. Maybe it's um, they, they, um, they just love coaching. Um, maybe it's, they had a mentor that, that gave them the opportunity. You know, I, I don't know what it is, but through their answers, I'm looking for that one snippet that says they're above the X's and O's they're above the titles um, they're above the wins and losses and all they're, they're simply here to be loyal and they just want to have fun with the kids and be a good person. I would so much rather hire a, the best teacher in the building who knows nothing about football than hire, you know, you know, somebody like Nick Saban, who is going to come in and think that he needs to be the offensive coordinator and that he needs to run this kind of offense and, and those kind of things, you know, um, I, I, this, that's just the way it is. And I've made my mistakes, you know, not every, you know, everybody always says your first year staff never survives. And, and that's true. It's happened every place I've been. Um, you, you finally realize that this guy's maybe not what he said in his interview, or maybe this guy doesn't really align with your theories. Um, the second thing I always tell my coaches is, is four things, um, which, it, which I think makes me a little unique as a coach. Maybe not like the only person that does it, but I think unique is um, I put family first. Uh, my wife and kids are, are extremely involved in our program. Uh, they ride the bus to the games with me. They ride home with me. Uh, my wife in our final four game on our last drive trying to win the game was standing right beside me while I was calling plays because um, she takes pictures and she's involved. And it's just that's not that's not common. So I, I want them to know, like, hey, your family needs to be involved. I want your kids here. I want your wives around. You know, I want to be a brotherhood as a coaching staff, too. So that's something that coaches. It's a lot more time sometimes because, you know, we're going to take cabin trips. We're going to do you know, family get togethers, we're going to, you know, come in and, and, and just sit down and, and talk about life and, and those kind of things. And um, I want them to understand that family's got to come first and I'm willing to let them make those sacrifices. And then the summer, and I want them to go on vacation and, and we shut down, you know, for about a 12 day period in the summer. And I want them to stay away from it. I don't want to, I don't want to have conversations about football during that time. And if you guys text me, let's talk about something else. And, and those kind of things. Um, the second thing is, is I talk about that uniqueness that I said that I've changed in who I am. Of, I'm not about winning. I'm not going to sacrifice teaching a kid a, a leadership behavior skill or, or building team, team chemistry or, you know, taking a day off to do something dumb. I mean, I told my defensive coordinator, I was like, hey, there's a chance that on a Wednesday on our rivalry game, I'm just going to say, hey, we're going to play dodgeball today. And you're going to have to deal with that. Like, and you're going to have to not stand back in the corner and, and pout and whine because you didn't get a chance to run you know, 15 plays versus Olentangy Berlin's best play. Like, I don't care, you know? And so if you're going to be on my staff, you're going to have to swallow that pill of football is going to come second to us a hundred percent. And then I talk about positivity. Like I, I have a rule of, I never want a kid to leave the field feeling like he had a terrible day. So in order to do that, every, every human being focuses on the negative. That's what we do, right? Like this is, that's our nature. We, we, we have the greatest season in the world, and all we can think about is that one bad call or that one bad moment or that stupid play that messed everything up. Um, so the only way that you can fix that is to be in their head so many good things that they do that they can very rarely think of that negative thing. You know, you can't go back to that one bad play. Um, so I tell my coaches what you have to do every day is you have to coach with what they're doing right and not what they're doing wrong. Reinforce yeah. right behaviors. And, and talk about the, the, the bad behavior. So take your arm and put your arm around and say, hey, man, like next time you get up there, can you, can you flip your hips this way? Can you do it this way? And then when they're out there, no matter whether they do the drill wrong or not, find something that they did. Hey, man, great stance right off the bat. Hey, I love the way you finished that drill. Hey, thanks for jogging back and getting in line. You know what I'm saying? I love the eye contact that you made while I was coaching. You know, find something good and just pound it and just keep going with it. And I'm, I'm a super positive guy. Uh, my golden rule for me is to never cross the white line in a bad mood. So every day in practice, I walk out and nobody really knows it and sees it. Cause I kind of do it nonchalantly, but right before I go on the field, I kind of give you one of those, like, 
you know what I'm saying? Like one of those moments where you just completely change who you are. No matter my day, I just take a deep breath and say, Hey man, I get to coach football and I step across the line and here we go. And I'm boom, like immediately I'm at it. And no matter how bad the day is, no matter what's going on in my life, that's two hours where I can just go do what I want to do. That's my getaway. Um, and so I talk to my coaches about that. Like I want every kid to feel good when they leave. Now, do I, do I know that we have to coach our kids and that they're going to make mistakes? Yes. But I don't ever want a kid walk off the field thinking they're a terrible human being or they're a bad football player or that they had a horrible day. So and if they do, then you need to catch them before they get in the car and you need to convert, you need to have a conversation with them. You need to tell them you love them. And you need to tell them you care about them. And that football is not who we care about. Um, and the third and the, sorry, the fourth and final thing is you just need good coaches, right? You need good guys. So you do some research, do some references, you know, how are they in the community? You know, what, what are they like in their job? You know, I, I've, I know this sounds crazy because I'm hiring a football coach, but I've called employers before and said, Hey, like, what, what's this guy like in the building? You know, is he a jolly guy? Is he somebody who walks in and, and brightens up the mood? Or is he somebody that sucks everything? And um, I'm a huge reader and a big leadership guy. So like the energy bus and I use like, um, you know, vampires, you know, the, those who is this guy a, a positive sucker? Is he a positive giver? Like, what is he? Um, you know, I, I go watch him in his element. You know, a lot of our coaches, you know, coach multiple sports. So I'll, I'll go watch a coach in the spring or coach in the winter coach and I'll see how he reacts with kids. Um, I told my staff at Only Change, I got the job in late January and everybody I interviewed from January through February, I told him I was not putting a staff together until March um, because I wanted to do that. Once I interviewed all these guys, I wanted to get around. I wanted to see them. Hell, I invited 15 of them back to the weight room because I want to see how they interact with kids. I said, hey, this is part of the interview process. I want you to come in. I want you to introduce yourself to the kids. I want you to go around the weight room. I want to see. Um, I say, I, I know, I don't care if you coach any technique. I just want to, how do you interact with the kids when you're talking to them? So I stand back and I watch, do they have a positive, you know, like when you got that guy that's super excited, he has that positive bounce to him. And then you can watch the kids and then the way they react. Kids are, um, I, I hope this is okay to say on your podcast, but kids to me are douchebag catchers. You know, like when, when it's all said and done, they can come to you and look at you and say, Hey man, that guy was, that guy was kind of, yeah, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's an uncommon way to go about it, but I, I take my time and mm -hmm. I truly do uh, because we're, we're the type of team that we don't do anything football related until like mid July. Um, so schematically and X's and O's and all that, like we have tons of time. So I, I was perfectly okay if I didn't finish my staff going into June um, just because I was going to spend all that time getting to know them before we got to the X's and O's side of things. I can teach, I can teach everybody what we're going to do on the field in, in a three hour clinic. You know, I can, and that's, uh, that's fine with me. I just want to know what kind of people they are. Okay. Now can I kind of continue with your staff and how to approach, how do you approach <clears throat> weekends? Cause during the yeah. season, because it's like, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, let's be honest when me and you started, it was, you're, you're there till probably three, four o'clock, depending on if you coach JV or not. And yep. then Sundays, depending on whose staff you're on, you might be there till noon. You might be there till I, I hell, I remember staffs when I got started that were there till 8 p.m. on yeah. Sundays. Uh, absolutely. Like 12 hour periods. <laughs> like, I mean, how have you, how has that approach been for you? Because I mine's massively changed uh, yes. by yours. Yeah, no. Um, once again, I was very lucky that, you know, being on my dad's staff, my dad had learned enough of it that we we really never had crazy, crazy weekends. You know, we were brought our kids in at eight, we lifted, you know, watched film, you know, probably got our kids out of there at about 10, 10 30, went out, watched the, you know, JV game was home. Um, coaching staff kind of stayed around for a couple hours, talk about some game plan stuff and came back in on Sunday, had probably a, you know, two, two and a half, three hour, maybe four hour meeting, you know, but you know, some of those times, if you have a really good staff that four hours, you know, hour of, it's just, you guys talking about the stupidest stuff in the world, but you know, we were, <laughs> We, we as football coaches are the biggest waste of timers I, I think I've ever met, you know. Um, so, you know, that transition for me has been, um, we talked, you, you mentioned that I'm big on nutrition. I'm also huge on rest and recovery. Um, so doing all this research, I went and got my master's degree at Miami, uh, sorry, I went and got my master's degree at Ohio University in coaching, education. And through that, we took a um, strength and conditioning nutritional based class and 50% of the class was talking about rest and recovery and how, how that's the most important thing in nutrition and in um, stuff. So my mindset completely flipped and it was actually a very similar year that we kind of made that transition with our culture playbook and took winning out. And so we now, our process is we don't bring our kids in at set on Saturdays at all. 
I tell them I'd rather sleep. I'd rather you guys go home and get 12 hours of sleep on Saturday. Um, and so we, as a coaching staff, I have all my coaches come to all home JV games. Um, if it's an away JV game and they want to pop over, it's great. Um, it gives me an opportunity to go to all the JV games and coach our kids. Like I, I get to coach every kid. Um, and that's exciting. And I don't, I don't overstep my bounds. I just come out there and I'm, like I said, I'm a super positive guy. So I'm the, I'm basically the cheerleader on the sidelines. I'm the hype man. Um, but it, put, it allows me to do a, something different. You know, I'm not on the headsets. I'm not calling the plays. And then uh, Sundays we come in for two hours, period. I tell my coaches, if we can't get done in two hours, we're putting way too much stuff in. If we can't do it, because let's think about it. High school kids aren't like me and you anymore, right? They don't just love football. They don't just sit around and, you know, have red notebooks that they've trumped plays after plays on there. If they're doing anything football related, it's Madden, mobile Madden on their phone, you know, yeah. and, and they're just randomly picking plays and stuff. So um, to me, if, if you're, if you're implementing a game plan that takes you longer than two hours, um, that's too much. Now we're also not the type of team. I take a lot of stuff on my own shoulders and I, I, I make my, I create our own scripts. I create the practice schedules. Like I don't sit there with my coaching staff and do all that, um, which I know that part takes a lot of time. If you're talking about creating scripts for practice and those things, I usually do that on my own, um, either Saturday building up to it or Sunday. And I just share it with the coaches during that meeting. We just talk about it. I say, Hey guys, what do you think about this? You think we're running this enough? Um, if there, if there's a new little wrinkle, we adjust it slightly, but I kind of take all that time on myself, um, rather than making my coaches do it. So we're in and out in two hours on Sunday. Um, sometimes it's morning, sometimes it's evening. I think it just depends on the schedule. And then what we do that I think is super unique in our program is we use Monday and we call it fundamental Monday. Um, so we do not implement our game plan on Mondays. What we do on Mondays is we come in and we watch the film from Friday night and each one of my coaches is responsible for their position and clipping up no more than 10 clips. And then I, I'm responsible. I clip up five like team-based clips that I, something big I want to show, whether it's a, you know, a big sacrifice play by a kid, or maybe it's a huge special teams play, or maybe it was a, you know, really crappy um, effort play that, that I show to the kids. You know, so I pick five clips, both good and bad, um, that I show to kids. And then we split up into our individual groups and they show eight to 10 clips of good and bad. And, and that's it. And then we jump from there we immediately go out to the field and do um, a 45, 45 minute offense and defensive individual period to where we work on all those things that we just got done talking about with our kids that they messed up, you know, whether it was a false step, whether it was a, you know, lack of reading a guard, whether it was a, a, a terrible route run. Um, those are the things that we turn around and go focus on, on that day. And then we get our kids out of it. You know, so we run a quick hour and a half practice on Monday with probably a, an hour, roughly an hour session of, of film just because you know by the time you break it all up and you get everybody through and you do a little bit of talking um and then we come back on tuesday and that's when we implement our game plan um it puts a defensive coordinator a little bit of bind so they do some things like like my dc at, at bloom who just got the job he would um like send the scouting report out on sunday night you know and and kind of message the kids and say hey get on huddle and kind of go through this and he would like talk through it you know kind of so that was kind of our scouting report meeting and then I would give him, you know, some meeting time right before practice on Tuesday to, to go through it in person again and, and do that. Um, but that's kind of how our weekends really have been is, uh, and, and here's what's helped also with that is since we're not doing things on Saturdays, you got all these kids that want to go on college visits and recruiting visits and things like that. Well, you don't have to be ticked off that they're not there because they, they have the day off anyway. So these kids can schedule those moments. Parents love it because they know that the kid doesn't have anything until Monday. So sometimes they'll take little trips and, and stuff like that. And what it does, it just builds a, once again, a positive atmosphere in your program because you're not just grinding. And one of the biggest reasons that we switched to this was I had a, I had a really good running back a couple of years ago. Man, he'll ever, he'll forever be remembered as um, the biggest headache, but also one of the best kids I've ever had. You know, he was just one of those kids that could get under your skin. He would show up every Saturday like he just went through like the biggest gauntlet war that he's ever went through. Like he's one of those kids, yeah. He's, so hurt he can't move he can't move his arm but then he would show back up on Monday and be perfectly fine and he was a stud he started all four years for us he was really good but I hated fighting with this kid every Saturday because he didn't want to do what we were doing he didn't want to he didn't want to jog he didn't want to lift and so I eventually got so frustrated that it was like man I'm done you know I can't do this and so we just decided to, to stop it and and just say hey let's just not worry about fighting with very group, you know, so. 
No, I, I get it, Coach. Like I said, I've had one of those. He'd limp in every day, work his butt yeah. off. So Act, acting yeah. like he's the worst. So, um, kind, kind of as we start heading to wrap it up, I mean, I, I just out of curiosity because I honestly don't know. I, I did not see any Bloom Carroll games this year. Um, just out of curiosity, can you kind of sum up your offensive philosophy? And I don't need like the deal play by play, but um, just out of curiosity, how your offensive philosophy, what it is, and how it's evolved over the past. 11 years. So, yeah, offensively, um, less is more uh, is the number one key for me. Um, when I came in, I was, a, I was a quarterback in college. I was a quarterback in high school. I love scheme. I loved X's and O's. I love drawing everything up and everything looked awesome. Everything looked good. Um, so less is more and fit it to your kids. Don't fit it to you. Um, once again, talking about kids don't do football nowadays. Kids don't go in the backyard and play. Um, so find out what they're good at and find a way to fit it to them. You know, I'm, I'm not a guy that says, we have to be this. So I've created a, an offensive playbook that encompasses everything. If we need to be a, a, a single wing team, then we can do it. If we need to be a, an empty team, we can do it. If we need to be a, a, a 12 personnel team, then we can do it. Um, and, and, and if you watch our games over the past four years, you've seen that. In 2018, uh, we were a 10 personnel, uh, two by two RPO team. Um, you know, a lot of inside zone with, uh, you know, RPOs behind it, a lot of bubble action game and quarterback run because we had a really good quarterback in 2019 that really good quarterback was coming up we were 90 percent empty and we threw it you know 40 50 times a game um, along with the quarterback run stuff and he graduated in 2020 that kid i was just talking about that gave you all those headaches was a stud running back so we were we were almost double type power eye at times so we were 12 personnel we were you know two back personnel most of the game um, and then last year um, that kid graduated and we went right back to our 10 personnel, three by one, two by two, um, real versatile, uh, kind of a quick passing game, um, inside zone, outside zone team. So in four years, um, and, and, and I know it sounds crazy, I've actually recreated our offense and playbook and signals the last three years. So everybody talks about how you're established, your kids know what you're doing. They actually technically learned a new offense the last three years, but because we're so simple, and, and we try to keep it that way from whatever we put in day one is our bread and butter day 14. And, and I'll give you a great example. The very first play that we put in this past year was a, we call it fire. Um, it's just like a quick gap scheme where, you know, guard or sorry, center blocks back on the, the one and the guard folds around for Mike, you know, kind of just like a, a little inside ISO. And we just hand it downhill to our running back and let him grind out three yards. But we can RPO off of that. We can throw the bubble off of that. So that's kind of what was our base was this year. That was the very last offensive play that we ran trying to score to win in the final four game. You know, so that's just who we are. Like we didn't – we had the ball on the seven-yard line with a minute 30 up, down three. It was second and seven. I didn't draw up some cool scheme. I didn't – we had, you know, three timeouts. I, I didn't do anything. I, I came right back to our bread and butter. And unfortunately, you know, our kid got down to the three and fumbled, but it worked. I mean, we got four yards. There's going to be third and three from the three going in trying to score to win to win the game to get to the state championship game so I wasn't lack of you know execution at that point in time but um so I'd say those two things and I finally like I said the last thing is is don't don't try to win a game with the scheme that you're putting in that week and that's kind of what we we've we've done is everybody has a player here that you think could work well if we can't practice it you know 15 20 times live well then we can't run it I don't want to run and, and so I tell my coaches that, like, if this, if this new play can't be run this week 20 times, like, we're, we're taking it out. Um, and that's been a huge evolution in our offense is we carry four running plays. Um, we, we carry more passing games, um, but we don't, we don't run all of them every, every week. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, kind of like the buckets thing that Ryan Day talks about. Like, we carry about 14 passing schemes, but we really take about seven to eight into a game. Um, and then we run two screens and, um, one, one basically reverse trick play and that's it. And, and, um, that's, that's what we carry all year long. So those four running schemes that we put in, in, you know, August, that's what we're running in hopefully November. And I think that's the biggest evolution of my offensive game is I've learned to map it to the kids and I've learned to not every Saturday and Sunday sit in a notebook and draw up all these things I think are going to work and I think they're going to be great but um, just sacrificing the fact that we can't practice all of it now does that mean that every now and then we don't put in a little wrinkle here or there we do but we try to wrinkle it with what our base is right maybe a play action 
pass, or maybe we just adjust one route in one of our concepts, you know, we rep it that week so we can get that in um, and, and go from there. I, I am an RPO guy. Um, every single one of our running plays is a, is a, is a pass run option. You know, it's, it's a built in play for us. Um, and then most of our passing game stuff has, you know, the ability to, to be adjusted. And so like, when I say we only carry those, like, you know, that, like if you're running yeah. four verts and you switch the outside guy and the middle guy, it becomes like a verts twist concept, which is completely different. And then you teach that guy that's twisting to, to learn to read, sit down. So it becomes like a sitcom, you know, sit, read. So you know, I'm not saying that we don't have some unique stuff, but I think we try to be able to build all of our stuff from like our base things. Okay. No, perfect coach. All right. Uh, coaches. Um, if you want to talk to or follow coach, his Twitter will be below. Um, so give him a follow there. Uh, like, share, subscribe, check out the sponsors as normal. Um, and then that was another episode of the Gap Down Backer podcast.